Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 716. That is Siete Uno Seis of the Agostino Zynga Show. I hope I said that right in Espanol. If I didn't, no hables inglés. But hey, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely little podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? You know how it is. All things going well. All things going well. Had a bit of a couple bummy days because of the news of Man United being sold to Sir Jim Ratcliffe, as he's been called now, the Rat Ratcliffe, right? He's now buying 25% of the club and getting in bed with the Glazers that he said he would never do because he's meant to be a United season ticket holder. I've kind of gotten over it. It kind of is what it is. Nothing I can do. And I'm trying to be somewhat positive going forward with the weekend kind of revving up to go right I've got some plans I may go back to fold which I haven't been to in a while I may do a little DJ mix of pirate the the, the the world is my oyster right the world is my bloody oyster so I'm trying to put that on my brain and obviously record these lovely podcasts for you lovely people out there who spend some time out of your day to listen to them so I do appreciate every single one of you out there doing so so before we head into the podcast topics, I wanted to quickly give some of you guys a recommendation on new music to check out. I've been listening to Troy Sivan's Something to Give Each Other since it dropped last weekend. And I have to say, this might be what I kind of talk about when I speak about the less is more. Because this album is only 10 tracks long, but I swear to God, it actually feels longer than 10 tracks. There's so many moods, so many different emotions, so many sounds, so many textures, so many interesting bits of songwriting that you actually think it's a far longer album than what it actually is. It's only 10 records. Now, one of the things I'm really annoyed about with Apple Music lately, whenever a new album comes out, for some reason, I'm starting to incorrectly download the um, non-explicit version. I'm not too sure it's because Apple are switching them around. If they're purposely putting the non-explicit version first in the carousel of albums that you see. But for some reason, ever since um, For All The Dogs, I keep m mistakenly downloading the non-explicit version of the songs. And it's annoying because I want to hear the flipping cuss words. You know what I mean? I don't want to hear this stuff censored. But the centering does work, you know, pretty flawlessly. It's not like you really notice it. When you're listening to it along and you're kind of catching some of the words and you know what's going to come next, and it doesn't come next and you hear a little pause, you're like, oh, this is probably the one that's been censored. So make sure you keep uh, an eye out on that. Maybe it's just me and I'm being redacted. But I've honestly have enjoyed Troy Sivan something um, to give each other. If anything, it's not as out at the gate. It's not as out of the gate poppy as I thought it would sound. It's a little bit more... Um, musical it kind of shows off his artistry a little bit more it, it honestly makes me super excited for the next album I know fans are annoying like that to artists he's probably worked on this album for many years I think yeah the last album came out what um 2018 or something like that right I think so or 2020 so it's been a while so for a fan like myself to say oh yeah I can't wait for his next one but this sets a good sort of basis and a primer to what he has coming up in the future. I think so. This kind of shows the kind of breadth and the range that he has because he could easily go down the really, I wouldn't even call it pastiche, but the almost cartoony, disco-y, poppy, indie dance lane if he wanted to. And he would smash it. Like, honestly, if he wanted to go down that route, um, you know, think of like MGMT, Tame Impala Sonics, right? Mixed with... Elton, Jen, Elton John-esque vocals. He could easily smash that if he wanted to. But he obviously likes to do what he does now at the moment. And the what I like about the album is that if you heard Rush, the single, which is honestly one of the best records to drop this year, it's really frustrating to me how it's sort of like dropped out of the flipping... Um, it feels like it's dropped out of the the listening of ship of people hearing it outside. I, I think I still hear people playing Kylie Minogue, um, Padam Padam way more than Troy Sivan's Rush, even though I think both records are probably neck and neck in terms of quality, right? In terms of ones I want to hear on the dance floor when I'm at Panorama Bar, when I'm at Palomas, when I'm at any other party around the world, and I want to hear that kind of really poppy, glitzy, 
feel good music on the dance floor that you know you might hear on radio because sometimes some of the best sets ever are usually those sets where the dj would swing in a little kind of bait track that you all know and love a good example of that is cormac he absolutely smashes that ability to do that um and obviously boris one of the residents over there berghain but i really do like both tracks but it's a shame that rush is sort of like falling in the pecking order compared to um kind of those padam anyway go back to troy sivan i really have enjoyed this album i think it surprised me because it doesn't sound like what rush sounds I think in my head, I thought, okay, he's got Rush. He's got a particular kind of, you know, um, palette he's going for. And even when he dropped, uh, what was it, One of Your Girls, it also sounded within the Rush sort of like sonics and with the Rush sound of like themes and sounds. But then when the album comes out, the range of tunes he has on there is really broad. And like I said before, for all the artists out there that just pile nonsense onto the album and don't do any quality control, there is something to be said for somebody that puts together an album of 10 tracks and it legitimately sounds like it's much longer than that. I think the runtime of the entire album is like, 30 minutes or something like that so if you're somebody that doesn't have a lot of time you hate the whole like 20 plus records on, a, on an album and you want to listen to something that's going to make you feel good that's going to be a good little bit of company for you to it's going to be a good little um soundtrack to take you to work um to take you to go see your parents to take you on the little errands that you run um during the day and in the weekend i really recommend something to give um something sorry something to give each other by troy sivan one of the records that i really like on this right that I think is superb, might be Still Got It. And it kind of reminds me, if I'm not mistaken, Still Got It reminds me, um, is it Wildest Night or Coldest Winter? What is it? There's a, there's, a, there's a track on 808s and Heartbreak. That's it. Say You Will, sorry. I know it's not the right one. There's a track on um, 808s and Heartbreak by Kanye West. The first track on that album, 808s and Heartbreak, called Say You Will. And for some reason, Still Got It sort of sounds like Say You Will. If you haven't heard it before, please do. Please check out Kanye West Say You Will from A West and Heartbreak, one of his best albums ever. That album or that single, um, or the track, sorry, on Troy Sivan's album, track number five, sounds very similar to it. So I love the feel of that. But my favorite, and also just to make an actual point, actually, in my room, featuring this person called uh, Guitarra Cadilica Fuente. I'm not too sure if it's actually Tracy Vance on the album or on the lyrics and stuff or somebody else. I'm not too sure who's actually singing in Spanish, but I really did enjoy that song. But my favorite song on the entire album has to be Silly. It's got such a good vibe to it. I love the lyrics. Um, and it's actually produced by this guy called Ian Kirkpatrick, who also, if I'm not mistaken, produced one of my favorite Dua Lipa records called Don't Start Now. You know, the one that's like, if you don't want to see me dancing with somebody, right? You know that one, right? I sound exactly like fucking Dua Lipa, right? If you want to believe that anything could stop me, <laughs> don't show up. Hey, don't come out. Hey, don't start caring now about me now. Walk away. You know how. Don't start caring out about me now. <laughs> and there's a really good uh, remix of it too by K Chanada that came out a few um, years ago as well that you should check out if you haven't checked it out. It's one of the underrated K Chanada remixes, like his absolute slapper. I remember when I used to play out a lot, I used to always drop that on the flipping dance floor and people would be like, oh, 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 oh. I mean, it's an absolute banger of a track. But yeah, Silly on Troy C. Van's album, track number eight is probably my favorite. The second track that's probably my favorite outside the singles the obvious ones might have to be the last track um how to stay with you the songwriting on that is pretty magical i'm not gonna lie and it might make you very very emotional once you kind of um read some of it out uh let me see if i can find it and it's very you know it's, it's very interesting but let, let me let me read it to you right it says uh um cut my garden down i've got no flowers but it's the t it's the thought that counts i wish you lived a little closer maybe when we're a little older we can set up a shop back where you are or i can take you home i feel like my brother might like you just not the same way i do it's so cute so magical it makes you want to smile it's a really lovely 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 record i'll continue because why not it says boy i wish you were the peace to get me out of the game if i have to say what i mean is it fair to say all of these visions impair my decisions and i can't stop I'm a little bit fucked on this. I'm a little bit out of time to spend with you. Baby, turn around. Give me one more kiss. I'm a little bit lost on how to stay with you. 
<laughs> this is one of my best bars. The best bar in this in this track, verse two. I turn my bussy out. It's been a sec, but I didn't forget how to pull you in closer in case it's not till we're older. Then that we are that, that sorry that we reach the top, the pinnacle of everything we are. I feel like my mother might like you, just not the same way I do. Isn't that sweet, right? You're talking about bussies and you're ending it with your mum being a fan of the guy you're probably seeing. So big up Troy Sivan. Honestly, one of my favourite albums to drop this year. Um, it looks like all of the albums that I've enjoyed the most this year have been the ones that haven't been hip hop. Um, it looks like hip hop has had a bit of a downturn this year. The quality control hasn't been the greatest. Um, I still think Drake's album was very, very um, under undeservingly panned. I think now going back to it, listening to it, people will probably re re you know reverse their decisions and their knee jerk reactions to it because I think people just assumed because it was for the dogs, because he was talking a lot of smack online and he was saying certain things, people just assumed it was going to be a stone cold rap album back to front but i think it was far better than what people give it credit for still not at its peak what drake could actually do but it was still quite better than what he gave it for but in terms of the albums that dropped this year i think outside of hip-hop it's been really good there's been a lot of good pop records a lot of good r&b records and shit a lot of good metal records out there so i really recommend another one to add to your listening um you know whatever you're going to be listening to this week please check out something to give each other by the one and only troy Sivan that came out this past weekend really really was impressive um album and i'm just impressed at his you know courage to put together an album with only 10 tracks on it after spending so much time on the sidelines right not releasing music to suddenly put out a very unapologetic a very creative a very artistic a very emotional sensual personal but also fun record in the midst of everything that's going on in the world dropping it now perfect 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 i loved it i enjoyed it check it out check it out if you haven't already Moving on from that one, I need to mention something here which is really interesting. So, The Verge is reporting that Apple have announced the release of an entry-level Apple Pencil with USB charging. The headline says, The new USB-C Apple Pencil supports hover with the iPad Pro and can attach magic, sorry, magnetically, magically. <laughs> but at $79, it's cheaper than a $129 second-generation pencil. I'm just surprised that this pencil stuff never really took off the way it probably should have taken off you know how people really had a big time or really loved the idea of a foldable keyboard had that magnetic that magnetic magnetically snap sorry uh, I'm, I, I, it sounds like i'm saying negatively isn't it i don't know what's happening in my flipping words here but i felt like people were way more excited when they had those magnetic keyboards that sort of clip onto the side of your flipping ipad and it also has a bit of a kickstand on it that you can kind of use when you're on a plane or when you're in a train and shit but for some reason the pens never really took off the way they should have um, especially when it comes to like design especially when it comes to art obviously the most famous person i can think of that does a lot of their art on an ipad using a you know a digital pencil and stuff is david hockney right the legendary um english artist but for the most part a lot of people don't really vibe with pencils and t on tablets and shit. And I wonder why it's never really been adopted on mass the way it probably should have. I really do wonder. Anyway, let's read the article with Curtis of the Verge. It says Apple has announced a cheaper Apple pencil that comes with a USB C. The iPad accessory will cost $79 and comes with a sliding cap that reveals a USB C port, as you can see there on top. Um, it also attaches magnetically to the side of your iPad, even with a 10th generation model released last year. The cheaper price means that the pencil doesn't um, come with the more advanced features like first and second accessories. The device doesn't support pressure sensitivity wireless pairing or charging or the double tap feature that lets you switch between tools however it still supports hover with h2 models of the ipad pro um the first apple pencil model used a lightning connector that jutted sorry that jutted out of it to plug into an ipad while the second generation charged wirelessly and is compatible with the 10th generation apple ipad released last year usb c pencil is compatible with the ranges of ipads including the third to sixth generation um, ipad pro apple released the second generation of the pencil in 2018 and aptly named it the apple pencil 2 it's a huge upgrade from the original model and it features like wireless charging a way to magnetically attach the side of, of a supported ipad and support for the gesture controls for things like switching tools so clearly it works clearly people love it but like i said it just hasn't captured 
the overall public imagine no or the creative imagination of people out there that do like graphic design and whatnot full time and i really do wonder why maybe it's stuff like you know using an actual computer is better maybe um using pen and paper people should prefer that i'm not really too sure but i'm really surprised that apple pencil stuff hasn't really kicked on the way it maybe should have kicked on because there was a time in my life when i remember seeing you know um sketches and concept ideas of stuff similar to an ipad or a tablet with a pencil on it and it really did look like something you'd see in a jetsons it really did look like super futuristic but now that it's come about people really i wouldn't say take it for granted but they don't really pay it no mind and i really i'm curious as to why maybe it's a price um maybe it's the fact that the utility a lot of people out there probably won't need to use this if you're not if you don't draw or if you don't care about doing it digitally and there is probably a, a huge amount of people out there i would assume who still probably enjoy um, drawing, painting, whatever it may be, the old-fashioned way, with a pen, paper, with some paints and shit, with canvas. There's probably a lot of people that still enjoy doodang over the tablet thing. So that's probably why it never took off. It kind of reminds me a little bit of why, like, um, digital magazines and digital comic books never took off the way they should have either. You would assume people would want to do that, but people actually enjoy buying coffee table books magazines flicking through them even with the you know overabundance on fucking ads and shit they still prefer that tactile experience over just reading it digitally on the ipad and stuff so it kind of is what it is really but big up apple for what they released there big up apple for what they released there next i wanted to mention this interesting article courtesy of hypebeast which features a look around the new dice headquarters in london first of all it's odd that hypebeast are pushing this on their site like you know it's just a company that has done a refurb of the office and they're featuring that the you know the, the refurb on their site i'm not too sure if this is kind of a partnership thing that they're not really announcing or if it's just what you know you would do for a company that kind of exists within this sort of like streetwear creative trendy hipstery scene and obviously it's probably designed by a very well-known architectural firm so it probably works as an opportunity to show off the skills of the architectural firm some of the things that have been done in your office that are quite impressive that everybody would kind of want to look at in terms of furniture design and whatever it may be and then you would imagine it probably is a very sly way to advertise dice as a company maybe to prospective investors maybe to potential employees and just to kind of give the you know to kind of give people an insight behind the curtains a peek behind the curtain sorry as to what goes on at the head office of what it kind of looks like at the headquarters here in london so i guess that makes complete sense in that regard but um it also does remind me of a time back in my days when i was coming up in a scene of when this sort of stuff would really excite me now i don't really give a fuck i mean it doesn't really matter because i know now working for companies usually unfortunately for the most part when you work for companies and they have really spanky amazing well-designed um really tasteful offices like they have here most likely the working conditions are terrible that's the real shame about it it's not even like they go hand in hand if you go to an office and they've got bean bags they've got table tennis they've got um you, they've got these clear glass jars on the kitchen counter full of unlimited snacks that don't look like they ever run out um they give you a hamper during your birthday they have unofficial drinks every friday they have pizzas when they have team meetings right they have all hands they have beers all this sort of stuff most likely the working conditions um aren't going to be the greatest so you have to give up one for the other which might not be the baddest bargain to make if this office is located in a decent location somewhere in london you could potentially have the privilege and the and the fucking grace and the luck to actually be able to work walk to work which i've never had the ability to do because i've never lived in trendy areas of london i've always kind of lived in the hoods and shit but if you live in a trendy area and the office isn't too far, you get to work for a cool company and you get to walk to work, which is a incredible, incredible, incredible gift um, to have because you save so much money on fucking transport, which is cost an arm and a leg here in London, which is probably why everybody cycles. But then not everybody wants to cycle here because it's also really dangerous to cycle because number one, your bike could get jacked and you could get run over and your brains could be splattered all across, you know, Clapton Pond and shit and no one will be there to fucking scream and call the police for you because everybody kind of turns out they don't see shit so it becomes a real problem but 
sometimes all these things can really be an advantage and can sometimes make up for the lack of good working conditions the lack of company culture the lack of maybe um whatever you know just drive in the company the lack of kind of feeling like you're a part of a team and that you're feeling like you're being seen and you're given work that's making you um, improve as a person blah 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 maybe having the ability to go into the office where it looks the way it does where maybe you're able to stay here late and record your own content you can have meetings in this incredible spaces and shit um there's access to incredible coffee table books they've got great wi-fi nice refreshments drinks and shit um meeting rooms at work uh, whatever all that stuff right free macbook that sort of stuff some people maybe accept that over the the kind of you know what it looks like and shit for me having had a lot of experience working in startups and shit and other big corporations i would have to say that i am a big stickler on working conditions um i think knowing what you know kind of having an understanding of your role and what job and what role your and what how your role affects the entire company like the you know how it kind of goes and shit and how you contribute to what is happening there um feeling as if like you're being seen feeling as if like your work matters um and just general company culture for me and obviously pay are the most important things for me more so than having a trendy office more so than having a cool place to park your bike more pl- more so than having they probably got a little dj booth there you can, where you can play some tunes maybe all the wannabe djs in the office can play their own sets there all that stuff is important don't get me wrong it adds to it especially for dice because they're basically an event ticket in platform and shit right and they do their own events too i'm imagining so it's probably handy to have those things to be tied intrinsically to music but what you really want is just to feel like you're working in a place where you know you're respected um your work is honored you feel like you're part of a good team and shit and whatever it may be all the architectural shit could probably be the bias you know it could could be something one of the last things that you really kind of bother about but hey maybe i'm in the wrong here let's read the article a little bit courtesy of hype piece it says stellar concept has transformed a four floor four floors jesus christ dice is blowing up in it but it makes sense didn't they buy a boiler room um, recently right they bought boiler room i'm pretty sure so it just makes sense um has transformed a four floor victorian building into the home of ticketing and live event platform dice located in east london the headquarters has been designed to feel homely with warm tones and tasteful details employed throughout um for the dice ceo philip hutchinson philip hutchinson hutchion or hutchin no hutchion i think his name is uh, dice ceo phil hutchion in addition to providing an inspiring place for employees and avoiding gimmicky office designs was paramount we kept meeting design firms and they were all the same functional or wacky designs that felt like an office i would never want to work in i didn't want another office i wanted a space where people felt inspired that's true to be fair it does look different than the usual offices that you'd see in old street and shoreditch and other parts of london where all the cool trendy offices are and shit right it doesn't look like it's full of bean bags there is no one table tennis or pool table or darts thing to be seen so far um that's pretty nice there's none of that um cringy fake astroturf on the outside balcony right like it's it looks pretty decent like it just looks like a really well-designed home that you'd see in architectural digest so big up them for doing that i guess um let's continue with the blurb here um a regular at the non on sorry a regular at the on-site cafe hachian asks to meet the team behind his interior design and as such um seller concept was brought on board overall the team took a modern yet warm approach inspired by italian designer um gay uleti aulenti she believed in the power of the occupants in making a room um seller concepts creative director and founder pat jana von stein kept focus on the people who use the space wow boy that's a really cool office i don't know i'm not gonna lie that building is great it looks like an old factory it says collins and hayes maybe it's a sugar factory or something who fucking knows but it looks really really cool the actual building itself and i love the fact that they haven't fucked around with the um what would you call it with the exterior too much sometimes buildings like this anyway there is a lot of restrictions around what you can do to the outside of it so maybe a lot of it isn't like their decisions they just can't you know you're not really allowed to like strip this back and turn it into a fucking mcmansion but i still like the fact that they did leave it fairly the same as it probably was probably stripped away some of the gunk on the walls and shit but i like it's just got exposed brick all the glass there loads of natural light coming into all the rooms you know what i mean it doesn't look crazy um i do actually like the exterior i'm not gonna lie some more pictures of the office here got some nice chairs um i love the use of the metals or the steels for the cabinets and shit 
I really do like the look of it. It gives it an industrial feel. It also kind of feels warmly, warm, sorry, but it also doesn't divide or split the rooms up too much. Maybe that's the whole point. It kind of makes things flow. It's sort of like a way of using glass. You know, people use glass to make rooms feel bigger. I feel like using this sort of steel sort of design also allows the rooms to feel like they're all connected. And obviously with the holes inside of them, you can see through and shit, but it doesn't feel like, you know, big black blocks of wood and shit. Obviously, it's allowed to expose beams here. I love this flipping um, really nice U type, type um, sofa here to chill on and have a good time. That'll probably be full of gunk and all this rubbish and shit when people get in the Christmas party spirit and somebody gets, you know, finger banged on the sofa here, probably. That'll probably get a bit crazy. Um, again, nice desk, nice table. Yeah, this is a really nice office. I'm not going to lie. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like, one of the acne studios acne studio store maybe it was one of the refurbishments they did recently it kind of has a little bit of a vibe of an actually acne studio store maybe the architectural firm did that as well i'm not too sure but it does give me it's giving acne studios um uh, it's also giving um whatever that hotel is in london in shoreditch is it additions i don't know what it was called before but it's kind of giving one of those type of vibes it's got like a really trendy hotel lobby type of feel to it um a little bit less stark than the hotel lobby but it does kind of feel like that tiny bit when you're looking at it again oh look at the flipping kitchen counters i like that there's the, I guess that's the bit where they where you can fill up your glass to get some water um, or whatever it may be. And it's all kind of this weird um, mirrored warped design of steel as well, which looks pretty good. Gives it nice space. And again, loads of use of, I guess, loads of woods, loads of metals and steels. Um, all the sofas have been upholstered, got upholstery on them and feel really nice and warm. Those are really cool. I'm assuming these could be little meeting bits as well, where you could have like, you know, little chats in here when you can't use the meeting room and you can kind of gather around and look at, you know, look at the screen of your MacBooks and flick through the decks of your presentations just before you go and present it. It's an office full of people who don't really want to hear what you have to say. We have to do it anyway. I love this pyramid design or this kind of, you know, is it pyramid design? Whatever this step design is called, um, where you could kind of sit around as a group and do what you've been doing there. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the, when I left Depop, they had in the foyer they had like this little they had this little step thing that you could kind of sit down on and shit it's kind of a nice way to kind of have a bit of space that isn't connected to the main office where you can kind of relax and shit and have shoot the shit with your friends or your colleagues at work let's continue the article this is on the ground floor um an open flan is a sociable flexible and has the ability to transform into an event space here integrated seating elsewhere and com accommodated the company's monthly team talks a dj booth has been placed on the central platform nice across the first second floors workspaces and meeting rooms are dotted while the top floor offers a space for a quiet research and reading with a library full of books okay i like that idea i like that all the hustle and bustle is on these earlier floors and then when you get to the top it gets really quiet i'm guessing that's the last slide that we saw here when you get to the top that's where the sort of like library ish type style things are so it's around here right this is where all the quiety bits where you can come and like sit down and have whispery meetings and obviously read your book and shit that you've only got into the first couple of pages and pretend like you know what you're doing and um, for most of the furniture seller concept came up with the bespoke designs which have been made by British craftspeople and a combination of res responsibly sourced cotton, stainless steel, and wood. To add to the lived in feel, vintage pieces were selected and slotted in around the entire office. Take a look around, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, it looks really good. Um, big up Seller Complex for putting it together. Big up Dice for promoting it, I guess, on here. And I'm assuming there's going to be a bunch of people out there that are going to be like, you know what? This office looks banging. I want to work there. But like I said before, um, just keep in mind that just because the office looks trendy doesn't mean the work environment is going to be the greatest. So, just, you know, obviously inquire obviously find out um there's site site glass store that exists for a reason um see what people are saying on there make an account if you can't log in and read the reviews and see what people have said about working in those places the interview process bloody blah, blah 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 what the promotions are like all these things and usually try and read all the reviews it doesn't matter if the person isn't working in it doesn't matter if the review isn't in the area that you want to work in or the, for the role you want to apply for make sure you read all the reviews because most likely the common complaints about a company will be felt in various roles regardless of if they prefer the manager they work underneath or not whatever company culture things that get under their skin or whatever work x they have will probably be universal so make sure you check things like Glassdoor, inquire find out um because you know with, when it comes to jobs you really have to have a good level of job satisfaction 
position and feel comfortable in the space you're in in order to do your best work. That's my personal humble opinion. I think those things are far more important than having good Wi-Fi and trendy office spaces, but it obviously does help because you spend a lot of your time over there. So it does make a lot of sense. Moving on from this, courtesy of Vogue, we got the news that Machino, Moschino, Moschino has named Davide Rene as a new creative director. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I haven't seen much... Um, backlash on the social media around this naming of Davide Rene as the creative director of Machino uh, even though everybody was pretending to be outraged that flipping what's it caring had hired another white male to take over the creative role they wanted more women there they didn't really care about the black straight guys anyway but anyway who gives a fuck but they really want women to take those type of roles and um, if I'm not mistaken having checked online the holding company that controls or that bought Machino back in the day also has a few other comp um, companies that they sort of like manage. I guess one of them is uh, Alberto Ferreri and Philosophy and a few other ones. But I'm pretty sure all the creative directors of all the brands that they manage or they bought um, are all white. And I'm pretty sure they're all boys or they're all men. So it's obviously <laughs> something happening in the industry where this is a thing for a reason. And I guess why I wanted to bring this up is more so as in like, it's probably an issue more so with the fact that it's only one type of people that get any type of roles as opposed to hey let's just get women involved i don't like that type of the conversation you know what i mean i want the conversation to be a little bit more interesting expansive and actually get into the crux of what maybe the issue may be so that maybe we can make some you know headway into maybe solving it because clearly if you listen or if you agree um you know or if you know anything about the industry you would know that there is a lot of women who work in the industry behind the scenes in various areas so it really doesn't make any sense why there wouldn't be any good candidates to take the role of creative director and then when you kind of broaden it out a bit more and you think of people like myself who are straight black males who come into fashion and want to get involved most likely if you're do if you are trying to get into it you're having to compete against the women and the gays who are usually at the pinnacle at the top of design and when it comes to fashion so i would imagine if you're a black straight guy or if you're a straight guy in general and you're coming into this field you're probably going to be of a very high standard because the standard that they set the gays and the flipping um women's is incredibly high you have to match that standard just to get a look in so it's interesting that people that look like me don't get an opportunity but no one speaks about that okay no one speaks about that and it makes me angry no it does i don't really care but let's just mention and read the article anyway so um congratulations to davide rene hey i also like um his announcement pictures as well i'm not mad at those in the slightest um it says here um davide rene is the new creative director of machino the highly regarded tuscan born designer will start on the 1st of november that's a pretty good way in it to start your fucking new job as creative director of machino on the first day of the fucking month right you get your new card you've got your new corner office you got maybe a new laptop you got a driver things just go the levels just go up a little bit isn't it so big up him man that must be such a great feeling a statement from the parent company um if afi confirmed this morning that massimo ferretti afi's executive chairman said in a new hire we are confident that he will play a pivotal role in shaping the future of machino rene 46 raw he's really young though isn't it, to take that role big up him has been a milanese um rumor mill's favorite candidate to succeed jeremy scott as Machino's created a captain for several weeks. After an excellent de decade at the helm, the American Scott left the role in March this year. The September show in Milan Fashion Week marked Machino's 40th anniversary with the four stylist designed capsules. Now Rene will become the fourth um, ever lead designer following Scott, Rosalia Giardini and founder Franco Machino. I'm really curious to see what his visual machine is going to look like. like much like um, when Alessandro Michele left Gucci, I was just more interested to see what type of gucci we'll see on the runway because alessandro michele's gucci was a very distinctive look that almost kitschy circus cartoony look well machine is probably more circus cartoony than jeremy scott so i'm interested to see what renee will be doing um under machino and how he's going to be putting it out will he start off doing what most people do when they take over such a, a bold vision prior to him starting and just kind of reset the palette and do something very minimal and plain will he try and do his version of that kind of cartoony circusy look i'm really curious to see what happens when he does actually um debut his first collection for machino it says renee appears amply qualified for the role until recently he was a head woman's wear designer at gucci he rose to the position during nearly 20 years of a french-owned rome-based house that's the areas of Marcelo Michele and Frida Gianni. To be honest, I'm actually surprised 
more people in fashion, especially the kids, why they don't just concentrate on getting a job behind the scenes? Because he's had a job working at Gucci for 20 years before he got the job of creative director. Now, of course, creative director is obviously the, the, the pinnacle and where you actually want to go to. But he could have been comfortable working at a level that he was working at, being the women's wear designer at Gucci, probably being responsible for designing a lot of the things that we know and love about Gucci and thinking it's coming from Alexander McKelly's hands, but it's actually coming from his hands and being the guy behind the scenes that people knows knows what's up and shit and living a really good life flying around the world fashion weeks you know working hard of course but just living that creative artistic designer life without the hassle of trying to be in front of cameras and the social media stuff and the interviews like you can actually have a really decent career in fashion if you make it because it seems like you can keep a job in the industry forever especially if you are really good at what you do people are going to want to keep you around um so yeah 20 years is a pretty good run well done him in an in an autobiographical note, um, he writes of Michele of Michelli. Um, he taught me to dream and bigger and push me further. Rene joined Gucci in February 2004 after nearly four years working alongside Alessandro um, Del Aqua, who describes um, as my first teacher and mentor in fashion. Rene is a graduate of the Polo Modo Fashion School in Florence. Um, Franco Machino founded his label in 1983. Um, Ba 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 cool. Massimo Fretti added on Rene, we have all been impressed by D Davide's extremely sophisticated vision of the fashion's power to create a living dialogue with the world around us and by his deep understanding of the House of Machino legacy and its roots. I'm really curious to see what I would love to know what a fashion house creative director role interview looks like. Like do you have to present a collection? Do you present ideas? Do you just have an interview and they talk about you as a person and try to get to know you a little bit better like i wonder what the interview is like that might be such a nerve-wracking interview to go to right like because uh, it's probably difficult to interview for a role as creative director for a big brand and then not get it and then have to go back to doing what you're doing before because you'd imagine once you take that step you actually want to be in the limelight you actually want to be the main head honcho guy so if you don't get it and you have to go back to being behind the scenes it's probably really gutting but yeah i'd love to know what an interview like that looks like to be fair but yeah big up davide renee hope he actually smashes it working at machino hope he smashes it working at machino next we have to talk about this this might be one of the most hilariously sad articles I've ever read in my entire life, but also a constant reminder as to how difficult it is to navigate the nightlife scene here in London or in the UK being black. It's just so difficult, especially if you're black and you're hetero. There's something very um, dehumanizing about how you get treated, especially in some of the most swankier establishments here in London, when you look the way that I look. It's really, really annoying, I have to say. And it's even getting more annoying now with me and my little scene of stuff that I'm into when it comes to the sort of like, you know, um, techno scene, the disco scene, the LGBTQ gay scene, whatever I'm going to in terms of raves. It's really interesting when you go to these type of places and you look the way that I do and you don't maybe present the way that they would want you to present to get into those places and they discriminate to you. They discriminate you know you as well they judge you on your appearance and kind of rule you out of going there because you're not flamboyantly dressed you don't have your nails polished you don't have lipstick you haven't dyed your hair crazy colors and shit it's just really annoying because you're kind of going there because you enjoy being around those type of people that do those type of things and you respect and honor their little community and you want to be a part of it and you just love music but then they're discriminating you on what you look like and saying nah you possibly couldn't be liking what we're into and then it's obviously hurts even more if you're a guy that looks like me that has money that wants to go to a place where it's a bit swanky a bit more upmarket and you want to be surrounded by people that maybe have the same beliefs as you or whatever maybe right the outlook on life the taste in life and shit and you go to these places and they're like your money's no good here because you're black your money's no good here because of the way your hair is your money's no good here because of what you're dressing like it's really dehumanizing but it also is hilarious at how this played out because i think this guy has to have a little bit more dignity and pride in himself for what he did i thought was a bit cringy but let's let's um read the article courtesy of the independent it says black millionaire denied entry to top london bar claimed he was racially profiled so if we scroll down on the article um let me get um jamila hill out of the way but anyway it's gonna scroll down it says a black millionaire celebrity jeweler who was denied entry um to one of the popular london bars says he was racially profiled lamar burko 30 quoted uh sorry queued to enter 100 wardour street in soho west london with eight of his black friends <laughs> 
<laughs> I love how they detail that, innit? Eight of his black friends, the black ones, all of them, they're with me. Um, with eight of his black friends last week, but said that they were turned away from the restaurant and given conflicting reasons as to why. Mr. Burke said the group was blocked from entering <laughs> by a door attendant who was most likely black as well. That's probably the, the brutal side of things. A lot of the door attendants and security guards at all these swanky places in London are usually either blacks or immigrants themselves. So they should know what it feels like to get discriminated. But, you know, a job's a job. They put that firm hand in front of you or arm or bicep or chest and you're not going anywhere um who said um mr burger said the group was blocked from entering by a door attendant who said that they were too many men too many men too many many men <laughs> and among them only um and among them only to them sorry let's go that again because i didn't really get that one it says mr burger said a group had been blocked from entering by a door attendant who said that there were too many men too many men too many men among them only to then watch as multiple white people in the queue were waved through the doors. <sighs> in my field, I'm used to dealing with racism. In this country, it's always indirect, never direct. For example, I've been stopped by police so many times for no reason other than a car I drive. That is brutal because this also reminds me of one of the times where my little brothers, bless them, they went to Soho or no, they went to Brick Lane one time, I think earlier on when they were first trying to go out. And I guess I'd had no experience of going to Brick Lane or going to these kind of hipster areas with people I grew up with. Because where I grew up was, you know, what people would describe as a rough part of town. And I grew up with people who maybe did some questionable things in their life and maybe had to pay the consequence of the questionable things they did. But they're still my friends. But we only hang up. We only used to hang out with those. Or I used to hang out with those people when I was at home. When I lived back at home or when we were playing football or when we'd go to like little house raves and shit. There weren't really people that I would go out to the trendy events with. So I always had a bit of a split in terms of my friendship groups. I had friends that I went skateboarding with. I had friends I went to like techno parties with. I had friends that I went and drunk with and did drugs with. I had friends that I hung around with in the ends. So I never really had an experience of you know, of kind of mixing those friends with other friends. It was always kind of separate. I don't know why, but it just really was. So my brothers went to Brick Lane to party. And then I remember them coming back with really angry and just cussing out Brick Lane and everybody there. I couldn't understand why. And then they described the, the feel, what happened. And basically, I think they queued up to go to like 93 feet east or something like that, right? Back in the day. It's not even like a big swanky place or anything. But it's obviously, at the time, it was like Tech House Central or maybe like Funky House Central back in the, back then when it happened. And they were denied entry. So it was all my all my bro little brother's friends went there together. There might have been like 10 of them, you know, still friends, still boys. Like, why can't they all go together to a club somewhere? That's their friendship group. And then when they got there, the bouncer was like, yeah, denied. there's too many boys that you can't go in and then of course what happens as soon as they get denied a whole group of white lads come in um and they all get waved to go in so it's like you're allowing only the white guys to come in in groups but not the black guys coming in groups which is incredibly incredibly racist right there's no other way to kind of cut that because if you've ever been to tech house raves you'll know everybody causes an issue in there it's not even like based on race or even gender sometimes tech house raves with all the shufflers and shit sometimes it's the girls that get really really crazy so to sit there and say only the lads are the ones going to be causing the issues is really mad especially when you consider the people in there that are going to be doing the most drugs and actually going crazy will also be the whites so all that stuff really doesn't make any more sense but anyway we digress let's continue and then of course the bit where he says here about driving a car is also something that happens a lot in london um it maybe happens in every other part of the world also but for some reason a lot of guys who make a lot of money in london who then go on to buy nice cars always complain about being stopped multiple times by police and usually just to run like you know checks there's nothing, you know, they've got, they've got the insurance, they've got the tax, they've got the MOT, they've got a license. There's no reason to stop them if they didn't have, if they didn't do some sort of, you know, traffic violation or infraction or something on the road but they always keep getting stopped it's like a running joke and obviously most of it has to do with the fact that he looks the way that he looks and probably drives something that the police think he shouldn't be driving which in itself is incredibly insulting um and just it just makes you feel like shit do you know what I mean because especially in london a lot of police especially if you're the area that you live in or the place that you go to you'll probably bump into them a lot of the times so you would imagine they'll probably add a note to their car so that if it does get pinged up on the system they'll say yep yeah, don't worry we check your stuff it's usually good but they just keep stopping them again and again and again and again so you can't even this is that's why people say london and the uk is bad vibes because you can't even really enjoy your wealth and flex like you would do in other countries because people are always questioning whether or not you deserve not even deserve 
deserve it whether or not you whether or not that is actually yours um they're questioning whether or not you know what you're doing all these sort of weird things happen here it's a very strange place to live in that's why people usually try and dim their star and not be too like you know out there because they don't want people to discriminate against them and make them feel less than anyway continuing on with the article um as you can see there's a picture here of the young guy there standing in front of a really nice car with a nice suit and a nice watch it says but i could not believe my eyes it says here when the staff member took my friends out of the queue making everyone look at us as we're troublemakers then let all the white people in and not us i haven't slept i feel so violated exactly imagine that imagine how embarrassing that is to go to one of those swanky um soho places right let me see where she looks like 100 wardour street I bet you it's one of those places on like a bait road as well. See, exactly. It's in Soho. It's on a really bait street. So when you don't get in, people will definitely see you, right? There it is there, a really busy street. So when you don't get in, people definitely see you. They don't get in. And it basically looks like you're all in there trying to sell balloons and then they all chucked you out, which is hilarious because like I said again, you're most likely going to get offered drugs and toilets by girls that look like that than guys that look like the dude that's featured in the article. That's a really crazy thing about it. So fucking hell. Um, Mr. Boko has worked with some of the world's biggest stars, including David Beckham, Burner Boy, Steph London, Wizkid, Callum Hudson Adoy, <laughs> biggest stars, you know, Callum Hudson Adoy, um, and Joey Essex. Anyway, okay, cool. Um, the entrepreneur who runs LB Jewelry built his empire after being kicked out of school at the age of 15 hustler from the day dot right 15 entrepreneurial after becoming a jewelry consultant at age 19 he went on to launch his own business see him sitting here in a royce in a rolls royce he's got what looks like an ap on right he's got a prada shirt a massive chain like this kid is like living right he's living he's made his money he wants to go and that's the thing as well that's annoying it seems like if you're somebody like him who has a bit of money and you prefer to you prefer the nicer things in life and you want to go to these more swankier places, the 100, 100 Wardour streets, the Chiltern firehouses and shit, even places like fucking Soho House and whatnot. You have to have uh, a con somebody kind of co-sign you in order to get in and not feel like you're being violated in these places just because you want to go to a place that just is a bit more swanky. The only place where you might not get violated and be welcomed with open arms is places that are kind of made by people for that are made that by people that look like you, like you know whatever black raves are called and shit. But sometimes you want to mix it up. You don't always just want to go to raves. You want to go to a place where you can maybe sit down, eat, relax, listen to some cool music, change the environment, be around different people, whatever. And you just can't because they view you as other. Do you know what I mean? They don't view you the same as the other people in there, which is really disgusting. It continues. Um, Mr. Berko said he questioned the door attendant on why the group was refused entry when others were allowed in after being given different reasons. At first, he said that they were told that there were too many men, were told later the venue was packed, and even though they said the bar was nowhere near capacity. Mr. Berko said he told the employee who felt racially profiled and was told, I don't judge by race, just by the person. That's obviously a lie. If you're going to not let in eight of my friends, how are you then going to let everybody else in that comes in? That's the real kicker there. The jeweler said he felt compelled to explain what he does for a living. Ah, oh, this is where it gets cringe, and this is where he lost me. I'm never that guy. I'm never going to beg. I'm never going to plead. Like, even like I said previously on the other episode, the whole, um, you know, instance I've been having with this place called, or this rave called Hotbox London, and the fact that they, you know, essentially made me um, sing for my ability to enter into their parties and shit and have probably ghosted me for the most part because maybe I don't fit in and I'm not you know gay looking enough for them um, is you know it's probably enough for me to kind of be like you know what I wash my hands at that place good luck to you but I'm not going to beg and plead to go to a party it's really not that serious and I think the same thing has to be safe for venues whence you know it kind of reminds me of those clips you see online of rappers basically um, getting disrespected or being treated badly by store employees at luxury fashion stores and then they then go back and exhale the same day and spend loads of money there in an effort to kind of prove and kind of shame the fashion people for like saying hey i belong in here now see you didn't you didn't want to treat me with respect look at me spending 10 grand in your shop it's like bro you're not teaching them any lessons you're just making them money they work on commission the company gets the money in a the till they've not learned any lesson whatsoever like you're not really showing them up you think you'd where you think you are the way to show them up 
would be to make a stink about it online and take your you know and basically vote with your wallet and never shop at there again or with the brand ever again that would be the way to kind of you know really uh, make a stand all this sort of other stuff is a bit lame so this part of the story i don't like personally it really makes me feel uneasy and it really is lacking in pride and it really is lacking in dignity not even pride it's lacking in mostly dignity um he should have just like walked away after they gave him that bullshit reason um it says here the jeweler felt compelled to explain what he does for a living and even googled his name to show the door attendant the staff member said he would consult colleagues inside but the group was still denied <laughs> oh that's fucking crazy bro um <laughs> you google yourself and they still say no despite mr burker's offer to purchase tables at the value of ten thousand pounds I didn't even ask the price of the tables, but this was turned down. What reason would they really have to say no? I wasn't causing any trouble or shouting. I didn't flare up or swear. Uh, ben Kavila, look, Ben Kavila or Ben Kavila, I don't know sure if this guy's Congolese, um, who was part of the group and had driven from Northampton to meet Perko and friends at evening said, I've been through this before where I've been turned away at the door, central and the venue, so I wasn't particularly shocked. It's pretty crazy though, isn't it? Like you, you can't go out in central London if you're black. You have to just go to like parts of east, south, north and west. You only limit to box park, basically. If you want to have a good night with some of your homeboys and the fellas from the ends and shit, the only thing you can actually go to and be confident you're going to get in and have a couple of drinks, maybe catch a cheeky wine, have a good time and dance and stuff and sing along to your favorite records is to go to box park Croydon. That's the only way you're going to have fun there or the other one in fucking Shoreditch apart from that you're fl it's a real flip of a coin that is really heinous man it continues another friend 33 year old Gregory Nichols told the independent we weren't causing any issues it's not like we were Larry young lads outside we were quiet in line good as gold if you're going to make any assumptions about us they were any kind of threat that wouldn't have come across as up from our behavior this is this is something that happened to me through my and this is also what I don't like you have to kind of dim your star. You can't be your loud, expressive, black, unapologetic self. You have to go there and acquiesce and kind of act like one of them to get in. Then when you try and act like one of them, they still don't let you in anyway. So you're better off just being your unapologetic self, innit? Fuck it. And just not fu fucking with them in, at, at all. Um, we weren't causing any issues. Da, da, da. Um, this is something that happened to me in my, in my 20s, he says. Disappointing that in my 30s, I find myself in the same situation. That feels like the fact that we're black means that we're not considered good enough to enter certain spaces in a country, despite having the financial means to say so. That's why I also think it's imperative for black people that do get in to not feel like uppity and to kind of put their nose up at people that get in after them or that don't look like they belong quote unquote in a space because even though you might be the chosen black one just because you're with your white friends or because you're with people that maybe are more accepted in those spaces don't think that if you were on your own you wouldn't get treated the same way it's all the same reason why i had a little bit of an issue whenever i'd go to like Berghain in the recent years there's a night now there's a bit more of a contingency of like other black people that go there but most of them are like berliners so I, I don't know, maybe it's just my own assumption, but I get the feeling with a lot of like Berlin black folks that go to techno raves, when they see other Berlin people, no, when they see other black people that go to the techno raves, they sometimes feel like they want to be the only cool black guy within their friendship group. They don't want another guy. So you really get a lot of like weird frosty looks with some of them. Some of them might even give you dirty looks, look you up and down. Afterwards, when you bump into each other and maybe say a couple of highs and saves, they, you know, they kind of chill out and they realize, okay, cool, this, this person's not trying to take them over my my spot as the only black guy in the fucking friendship group but it's odd oddly it happens too consistently of the times i've been there it really is odd how often it happens and it's unfortunate because we're all in this together the fact that we have to kind of acquiesce and conform and dress a certain way right have our hair a certain way wear certain earrings put on certain nail polish and all this sort of nonsense just to feel like we fit in with these people is really dumb if, you, if that's your vibe fair enough but if you're only doing it to fit in it's awful and then when you see another person that looks like you not doing that thing you shouldn't look down on them you should maybe kind of bring them into your you know bring them under your arm and whatnot welcome them and make them feel at ease because you know how hard it was for you to get in and you have to do some questionable things to get in and feel comfortable so i just wish we would all kind of be in this together and also make a stand and also not do embarrassing things like googling ourselves in the queue to get in and seek their approval like they can go and fuck themselves to be honest after Boko posted about his negative experience on snapchat 100 water street instagram was flooded with criticism from users restaurant later posted photographs of black women on their stories no way i want to see that
Uh, <laughs> let's see the, if they've got an Instagram account. I want to see this. Where's the Instagram? There it is. 100 Wardlaw Street. <laughs> they started posting <laughs> uh, groups of fucking sisters, right? Oh, no. Wardlaw Street, what are you doing, bro? We don't believe you. You need more people, bro. What is going on here? Okay. Look, okay, they've got a picture of a PT that looks black doing some stuff. They've got some singers here. What, when was he taken? Let's see what they've said here on the comments. On the Wardour Street, let's see. They probably deleted them. Oh, look, 390 comments on there. Bamarati. Okay, they've got a post here that was edited, that was uploaded one day ago about Los Muertos Party um, for Halloween, I'm guessing. One of the first comments here says, make sure you do not play any music or song by black people. Let's see how successful the event will be. Oh, ho, ho. another one says the following. Um, let's see the one from before. One week ago, right? This is when it happened. It says, um, racism, do not give this bar restaurant in London your money. Wow, what's going on with these racism comments? Guys, chill. I've been there many times, enjoyed my time. They never suggested racism. It's always one. It's always one guy. Always one, man. Shut up, bro. Like, shut up. Uh, racism in 2023, this is extremely disappointing. And it seems whoever is running this account feels it is it, it, it's feel fails to see the severity of the issue. Post about people in the story is completely mockery. How can you deny entry because of a person's skin colour? Do not go here. Boycott this club. Racism in 2023. Say not racism. I would never go there. Your club racist. Wow, everybody's going in on them. People are this person posting as the vomit emoji, so it's not looking good for one hundred Wardour Street, which is a good thing because you know you don't discriminate against people's cut. It's just fucking shit. When people started getting on them, they went on the twenty four hour Instagram stories and posted photographs of black women back to back. I find that to be such a mockery. He continued, "I want them to understand that what they have done is mad. I'm speaking out because they're not making me feel like I'm crazy. The only difference between my friends and I and everyone else was who we let in." was who they let in was our ethnicity sorry 100 watch on street i thought responded more to comments from the independent so obviously again another example of just how hard it is to rave while black especially when you're black straight boys or you know what you'd ex what you'd expect to look like black straight boys right? i don't really sure what their sexuality is but i would assume they were it's just difficult whether it's going to techno raves especially if they're techno raves that are done by people from within the lgbtq gay scene even though they, they say it's inclusive they don't mean inclusive to straight people basically especially black straight guys they hate that shit so they kind of deny you entry to go in there and then when it comes to going to high um you know high class swanky upmarket bars where you want to maybe have a expensive cocktail sit on some nice seats nice ambiance have a little bit of a smoke right maybe look at some cute girls and shit they still deny you because they think you look like ragamuffins it's absolutely heinous and i fucking hate it i absolutely do um and again another example of why london is the bad vibes capital of the world why london is the bad vibes capital of the world i swear to god it's so fucking heinous anyway talking about heinous stuff um solidarity love and support to everybody that's been let go from band camp absolutely heinous story this as it's developing um this is courtesy of ra it says at least half of band camp staff have been laid off as epic games and songs trader closed the deal um it continues here it says at least half of band camp's employees um have been laid off according to a statement from the music retailer union today yesterday epic games band camp's former owner and song trader in its new owner completed the acquisition acquisition of the deal which was first announced last month according to bank camps united statements around 50 percent of the staff have been let go as a result 50 percent of the staff and if i'm not mistaken when they originally were debating or negotiating the deal for um what you call it for song trader to take over um, the acquisition of flipping Bandcamp. If I remember correctly, I remember reading an article that said they were given reassurances there wouldn't be any firings. And then when they took over, they fired fucking half of the staff. Like, absolutely wild. So this is a statement from the Bandcamp Union. Um, it says, Today Epic Games sale to of Bandcamp to Song Trader was closed and at least half of the Bandcamp staff was laid off. This is heartbreaking. We love our jobs and the platform we built, the Bandcamp community. We're glad that we have our union co-workers who have each, um, each other's back. We'll be moving together to decide what to our next steps are. On the Wednesday, we return to the bargaining table with Epic Games and we'll keep you updated. Love and solidarity to the whole bank camp community thank you for your support and it's interesting because if i'm not mistaken this has kind of come about because of the union 
I think they had some demands. I forget again. I forgot the details directly, but I remember something about they had some demands, a union, or they were trying to unionize. Then they put some demands forth, and then you know, basically, Bank Camp or the parent company said, "You know what? Enough's enough," and let go of a ton of people because I guess they didn't want to acquiesce acquiesced to some of the demands. But let's read the entire article to see what the vibe is here. It says among the layoffs are JJ Solnik, Diamond Sharp, and Atozi Moinzade, who worked at the Bank Camp's popular editorial team. Um, the daily bank up daily it's unclear what will happen to the platform now each of them posted on x to confirm their news um today's news follows comments from epic game ceo tim sweeney who is that tim sweeney from the radio session thing um who in an email staff last month said that the gaming giant will be laying off 60 percent of his staff in a statement sent to vultures today epic Games said that these are not new layoffs so they're trying to argue that these are the same layoffs that they were considering doing before they took over the company, which doesn't make really much sense, to be fair. In response to the acquisition, Bank Up United said that it's seeking employment offers for all members, as well as a voluntary severance offers and continuation of bargaining process at the beginning. That began, sorry, with Epic Games. Last month, Song Trader told Resident Advisor they would review the union's demands and that it supports um, for the band camp community was its number one priority. <laughs> Honestly, companies are such pieces of shit in it right last month song trader told resident advisor they had reviewed the union's demands and that its support for bank camp community was its number one priority once its purchase was complete then it's like five minutes later 50 percent of the staff got sacked fucking crazy all right context song trader earlier about the layoffs this is the comment the company's reply after a comprehensive evaluation and including the importance of the roles for a smooth business operation and the pre-existing function of Song Trader, 50% of the bank camp's employees have accepted offers to join Song Trader. Those who didn't receive offers will receive severance from Epic as part of their layoffs. So are they trying to say that they didn't lay off anybody and they just gave them offers that they didn't accept? Is that what they're trying to spin it as? Wild. Epic Games bought Bank Camp in March 2020. Two, a year later, Bank Camp United was formed. Um, we'll report more on this story as it unfolds. And then I guess you've got some tweets here from people who were part of Bank Camp, basically talking about how devastated they are. Maybe some of them being happy. Another one says here, um, this is the JJ Skoklnik says, officially laid off after two weeks of limbo where I expected what would be a case, but no confirmation. Nearly eight years at Bank Camp and it's over. If anyone is looking for a dedicated, talented, professional editor and culture writer, I am on the market. People that announce their job, you know, status like this on Twitter really interest me, to be fair. I wonder how many offers they actually get. Most of the jobs I've always got in my life have always come from actually applying. People who say, oh, I can hook you up, I can get you this, they never follow through. And I'm not really somebody that ever asks people for anything. I think that's incredibly lame. But I wonder how many people actually get things through this process of like, hey, man, can you help me? It's like, I don't know if that actually works. Maybe you have to kind of go out there and graph yourself and just kind of figure it out. Um, get you know, open the Substack. Um, you know, start doing the things people do. You know, set up a podcast, whatever it may be, and then start applying. In it, it just is what it is. But hey, what do I know? Um, another one says, "Hi, friends. Myself and many colleagues were laid off from Bank Up today, and I t had a good five years there. Looking forward to the future. I'm available for new editing work, social media work. You can reach me on the email in my bio. Another said, officially laid off from Bank Camp after two weeks of limbo and with my colleagues. Unsurprisingly, there have been no humanity extended in." this process our union will prosper though still working at brick still freelancing so don't be a stranger in response to today's news artists from across the electronic music scene expressed their condolences and frustrations yeah we don't care about what the artists have to say in it really to be fair but yeah um again um my thoughts and feelings go out to all the people from bank camp that did get fired it's never a good thing when you get fired from companies especially like this um it's even probably more disturbing when it happens um and it's not done under the guise of like trying to be cost effective because I haven't heard anything so far from the articles that says bank camp was running at a loss, blah, -de blah, blah, blah. Because those things are probably a little bit more easier to accept because you know they have to cut, make some cuts to kind of make the company stay afloat or help the company stay afloat. So you're not, you don't really take it too personally. But when a company gets bought out, usually from my experience, there's also the option that the company wants to keep the employees, maybe wants to add new employees. And the reason why people are buying them is because they want to keep the thing functioning. So people's jobs are never really at risk. So this must be a doubly hard to deal with because i'm sure a lot of these people were celebrating maybe before the fact that you know what you call it um the fact that flipping um epic games and song trader came in um for the fucking deal and now suddenly this flipping thing is looking very 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 dicey and again um force and feeds got to everybody that's kind of lost their job there at flipping band camp it's not good it's not great 
but I guess a lot of people probably thought, I guess a lot of people probably saw this was inevitably going to happen at some point as soon as Bandcamp went for sale the first time. I think I remember seeing on social a lot of people basically saying this is the end. And I think we've now been seen, we've seen now um, clear examples, even with the union set up that clearly Bandcamp, especially how it functions and the fact that it's for the artists and for the creators and bloody blah, 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 this community feel has completely gone. It's just going to turn into another soulless company, um, just churning out stuff that other companies do like Beatport and Juno and all these other things that exist out there. So that's a really sad thing to, to say about this sort of stuff. It started with good intentions. It started with a pure goal. And then as soon as it got sold the first time, every other subsequent sale has completely took away any type of soul, any type of humanity from the company. And now it just exists as a platform to just churn out music, basically, isn't it? That's basically what it is. Nothing else, nothing more. And again, the people that suffer are the ones that legitimately were part of building the company from the ground up. Um, so I can understand why that could be really hurtful. But again, um, you know, the world is your oyster out there. There's loads of tools and options for you to use to kind of spread your message and get your voice heard. And then you're hoping also because of all the kerfuffle with this, maybe some people will reach out to these people on Twitter and kind of give them deals and offers. But for me, I would waste less time announcing my employment status on social and just get to applying personally if that was me and opening a sub stack and setting up a podcast and doing videos and reviewing stuff for free and blah 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 whatever it may be done i'd get it done just to keep the lights on because it's getting cold it's approaching christmas and you know hey you need to get to get that sorted that's what i would say but again love and light solidarity to everybody over there at bank that got fired um keep your head up i'm sure you guys will land on your feet eventually and even if you don't make sure you push these motherfuckers until the end do never let go never take your foot off their necks get your severance get whatever you are deserving of getting or whatever's in your contract and make sure that you get it don't delay don't take your foot off the, their necks don't feel shy about doing so and i hope that you get a good resolution from that i really 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 do anyway that has been the Exynos Zinger Show, episode number 716. Thank you for tuning in today. It's been a really pleasure to have your company. I'll be back again tomorrow with another episode for you, so do not delay. That was a bit of a short one, just for the fun of it. But if you're listening to this podcast and you enjoyed it and you liked what you heard, why not leave me a five-star review on all of the podcast apps that exist out there, such as Spotify and Apple. You can leave nice little five-star reviews that let people know that you enjoyed the show. Of course, all links to my socials and shit are in the description, as well as links to the stories and what I spoke about. You can find them in the links of the description also. And and if you listen to it via the audio side of the podcast you shall be hearing my song of the day playing underneath my voice right now as this show rounds out so thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure never a chore and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe everybody peace